let me start to give an overview about what do we mean by Christian leadership. Um, let me start to ask, can we remember what was the last commandment of Jesus Christ? What was the last commandment he said verbally and the disciples heard it from him by their ears before he disappeared? Yes, well, that was one of his last commandments, but what, but was not the last. Okay, to make it easier, it was on the Mount of Olive, and uh, he said it, no, uh, uh, Mount of uh, Galim, and before his ascent. That was the, the last thing that he mentioned, and it was not mentioned in the Bible, it's actually, but it was written in the book of Acts, chapter 1. You remember now? Okay, we will remember together. When he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the entire, and to the end of the earth. That was his last command. And as we could see, this is actually two parts. It's a commandment and it's a promise in the new time. What was the promise? Yes, exactly. The coming of the Holy Spirit. And what was the commandment? To be his witness. Exactly. Are they linked? Yes, very much, obviously. Because we won't be able to witness until the Holy Spirit comes. And that was exactly, that exactly what happened. And how long it took for them to wait until the Holy Spirit came? After that statement was made, do you remember? Ten days. Right? It is the difference between His Holy Ascent and the Pentecost. Ten days after that statement was made by Jesus, the Holy Spirit ascended on the, descended on the disciples and the new church of the New Testament started. And since that moment, the disciples started to fulfill that commandment. And they started to witness to the Christ, in, to Christ in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the world, end of the earth. By the end of the first century, the uh, good news of salvation, redemption, spread all over the world. That world, the, the, the known world at that time. And through the, uh, the, uh, the missionary um, work of St. Paul, the gospel was spread all over the place. But the question to us, what does this commandment mean to us now? How to witness for Jesus in the 21st century? What is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to be? What does it mean to me? Can we hear some answers? What is Jerusalem? Is it the physical Jerusalem, capital of Israel, or this, it may relate to something else? It is? It is? Our hearts. Our hearts, ourselves, our souls. Usually Jerusalem, you know, symbolize the human being. And then, Judea would symbolize what? The family. The family. Yeah, the community where I belong. Usually, the community of, of, of Christ, which means the, the church. Okay? And then what would Samaria mean? What would Samaria for me? What would be? Those who are not related to you. Exactly. The community where I live, but not necessarily have strong affiliation to it could be considered as the the, um, the discomfort zone for me, where I don't feel uh, comfortable in dealing with others because we don't have the same background, we don't have the same principles, we don't have the same frame of reference. So there might be some conflicts, some frictions. So that could be the, 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 the community, the outsider community. And then the entire world, for me, would relate more to the, to, to the country where I live. So you are talking about four serpents. Let us try to see how, how they would look like. Okay. 
So we have four circles of Christian leaders. The first one is the person himself, as you rightly mentioned. This is Jerusalem. And then the second circle could be still the comfort zone around the person, immediate zone, which is the family, where I experience or exercise my Christian witness. And uh, each one of us is a member of a family. If he's married, so it's his spouse or her spouse. If he's not married, it's his parents or his sisters and brothers. So this is the first circle where I exercise my Christian witness, where my behaviors can demonstrate whether I am truly Christian or not. And this circle is very intimate, very private, and very genuine. Because usually we do not imitate, we do not show off during our families. We, are, we behave you know, naturally. We don't try to present something different from our real selves. Usually we behave normally. So that's why this circle is very critical because it shows the inner side without any kind of beautification. And it is very important because as long as I'm a true Christian in my cell, in my bedroom, where I have the intimate and real relationship between myself and Jesus Christ, this is reflected immediately on people who live with me in the same place. My parents, my sister, my father, my mother, my spouse, my husband, my wife, my children. That's why it's very critical. Very critical circle for Christian witness. And then comes the wider circle, which is the church. And the church is formed of families. And in our Coptic Orthodox Church, we are born from the church. And the term born again actually to us means that we are born in the baptism, we are baptized, and then we are sanctified and sacred for the Lord. Al Mayron, what is Mayron Yabu? I will need some help. Mayron. Mayron, it's called Mayron. And then I start to exercise my fellowship with my fellow Christians, my fellow Christians through the Holy Communion. And then I am I belong to that community of the church. And my belonging is not only just physical belonging for the place, in the space, but also it's, it's, uh, it's spiritual belonging, it's uh, social belonging, it's moral belonging, and this becomes the, the bigger family for me. And in countries in the diaspora, like here in England, the community of the church becomes the real family for me, even you know the real uh, kinship and relationship in the church, even more than my original family in Egypt. So for me, this is a very important, another very important circle for witness, where I can exercise my love, my care to others, and I, uh, I experience you know, the, the warmth of family. And in that circle, I should also exercise a sort of real service, so that I serve others and I'm served by others. So this circle is another important circle for Christian. And then comes the third circle, which is the community. If I'm a medical doctor, so I belong to the community of medical professionals, doctors, nurses, and uh, medics, and assistants, etc. If I'm a lawyer, I belong to the community of lawyers. If I am uh, whatever, say it, name it. Then I belong to a community of professionals, or I, I belong to a community of neighborhood. My neighbors, in the place where I live, or in the professional club, or whatever. So this is the wider circle where I have some sort of affiliation because of either my profession, or my living residence, or whatever. And this kind of community is another circle for my Christian witness. Because in that community, this to me is a sort of Samaria, sometimes. Because we don't necessarily speak the same language. My, uh, my fellow colleagues, medical doctors, or architects, or uh, teachers, or whatever, we share the same profession, but not necessarily we share the same values or same principles. And then in some critical situations, I might be tested to what extent I will be following the norm or following my own norm. 
which is coming from the Bible. So for some reasons and some situations, that zone is a discomfort zone for me. This is Samaria in a way, because there are some sort of conflict or enmity in that, in that sense. And here my Christian witness becomes even more critical, because to what extent I will abide by the Bible, to what extent I will abide by my world, my moral values, in the meantime, to what extent I will be tolerant enough to accept differences and weaknesses and diversity. So it needs also not only spiritual maturity, but also personal and psychological maturity, so that I can witness Jesus without losing people because I am very stiff, very strict, and cannot accept others. And the more we go to the wider and bigger circle, it is the country where I live. For almost all of you, you have double nationality. You are Egyptians and British, if I'm not mistaken. Sometimes, some people more probably are Eritrean as well, or Ethiopian. But we have some obligations to our country. You have rights and you have duties. You have rights as a citizen, but also you have duties that you have to abide by all the constitutional uh, obligations and rights, and you have to exercise your citizenship. But in the meantime, you are asked also, or you will be expected also, to witness to Christ in that bigger circle. How? By showing uh, loyalty, by showing respect, by showing faithfulness to your country, and also to exercise some of the political and social rights and duties. In country like us, in Egypt, and I'm sure you will all follow what's happening now, so this is becoming, you know, a very critical issue now, and everybody talks about al-muatana. You know al-muatana? Muatana is citizenship. Because the Copts, for various reasons, and for a long time, have been, you know, accused of being, you know, detached from the political life. They don't vote, they don't care about parties, political parties, they don't care about anything that relates to them, and we just contained in our incubators inside the church. But after the revolution of January 25th, 2011, and then the second wave of revolution, which took place in 30th of June, we were forced to get out of our incubators and to exercise some sort of witness that we haven't been trained on or used to. And this is another challenge. <coughs> For us in Egypt, we can see that this is a real challenge. And this circle becoming a very critical circle for Christian witness because all the Copts, Coptic churches have been attacked and almost 100 churches have been burned after 30th of June. You, you follow all these news. And the question was, what was the position, the formal position of the church? What did Pope Taurus do about it? How did the Holy Synod behave about it? How did Christians do about it? That was a very critical test to our Christian witness in such a very difficult situation. Nobody was prepared to this, but the Holy Spirit led the church to take such a position that was appraised by everybody. When the church, when His Holiness Pope Taodor said, we understand what's happening, we are not going to be led into fight because this is not our values, our Christian witness would dictate on us to forgive those who attack us and to be ready to, to give more churches as a sacrifice to save Egypt. A very spiritually mature statement and a very strong Christian witness and a lot of our Dear colleagues and friends, the Muslim ones, the moderate ones, said, what is your teaching? What is your, what is your Bible telling you about this? How would you behave like this? Nobody else would imagine that you're being attacked, your churches are attacked, and your houses are attacked, and you're just forgiving others and praying for them. What is this? This is Christian witness. This is a true Christian witness in the midst of fire. So our Christian witness is not an oath. A commandment that has been said 2,000 years ago. It is day-to-day -day test. It is a trial for each and every one of us. In various circles, and obviously the four circles are interacting and interlinking, because the more you witness to Christ before yourself, in your cell, in your bedroom, in your inner life, the more you can witness to your family. And if the family truly witness to Christ, it will be stronger church because the church is made up of families 
And the more the church is abiding by the Bible and has a strong Christian witness, it will influence the community and the community will, will influence the entire world. So these are four circles that are very much interlinked. And this is simply what it means to have Christian leadership. Someone would say, what, what does it relate to lead, lead, leadership to, to witness? As we will come in more details in a few minutes, we will understand that Christian witness is the essence of leadership because leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Leadership is not meant to be for some people who are supposed to have certain charismatic characters or charismatic talents and those leaders are either politicians or either preachers or are those famous people who speak so everybody listen or do things everybody follow. Leaders are not necessary to be foot football players or singers or famous filmmakers or famous movie stars. This is the way the world look at leaders. But Christ taught us that true leadership is much simpler than that, but much deeper as well, and much more difficult. Because God has worked through ordinary people to influence the entire world and to do extraordinary things. If you go back to the, to the earlier time when Jesus started his mission, and then he started to select 12 people to accompany him during his short period on earth, and to be discipled so that they can follow up after, after he leaves. If anybody would advise Jesus at that time about the best people who would be eligible and qualified to join him, what would be that advice? What would be people who should be the disciples of Jesus, according to our own thinking? You understand my question? Who? Well-educated well people. Well people, yes, very true. Like the scribes or like, you know, Pharisee. What else? Huh? Religious people who understand things so that they can link, you know, the New Testament to the Old Testament and they can memorize all the prophecies about the Messiah and they can just get it like this so that it will make his life easier and his mission easier. Wealthy people, so that they can, you know, put their resources to help him to reach more people. But Jesus didn't do that. He did something totally different. He chose 12 people who are shocking. His selection was, according to our human standards, are shocking. He selected fishermen. He selected some sinners who are stigmatized of being people of not worthy of any trust. And then he makes it 12 people who have no harmony at all between them. But, and then he started to invest a lot of time and effort with these 12. And he was preparing these 12 to be the true leaders of Christianity. Who fulfilled that commandment of when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witness to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the entire world. And they did, and they did it. So what were the criteria that Jesus, upon which he based his selection? His, leader, his, his, his main criteria was the potentials and the acceptance and the willingness to submit to him so that his Holy Spirit can work on them. This is what uh, St. Paul said later on, that he selected the ignorant people and he selected the uh, the, the fool you see? The ignorant and the uh, and the the uh, world and the poor and the so he selected the lowest people in society to challenge the rich and the well educated people. And the only answer to this is because the Holy Spirit worked on them and because Christianity is about influencing others spontaneously. It doesn't relate to particular tal talents or gifts, but it relates mainly to your willingness to submit to the Lord and you let Him guide your life and fulfill all the potentials that He had in mind for you before you were created. 
This is the whole idea of leadership. Leadership is influencing others in more or less spontaneous way by the way of living, by role modeling, by being filled in by the Holy Spirit and reflecting that in your circles, different circles of life, whether the personal, the family, the church, the community, and the entire world. So Christian leadership is built in in these four circles. And then leading in the church is translated into a science called church administration. To be able to lead the church in a proper way and to use the resources of the church effectively and efficiently and to manage the church activity and outreach, serving everybody everywhere and bringing everybody to Christ, to be able to do that, you have to have good management skills. You have to have good administration skills. And administration comes from a Latin word which has two components, ad and minister. Minister means serve. That's why the word minister is translated as a minister, wazir in Arabic. Or minister meaning, you know, a servant. So he is like a civic servant. So to properly serve is to properly administer. So administration and service are very much linked together. So if the church is properly administered, properly managed, this is a strong Christian witness. Because if the church, with all diversity of its components and congregation, different talents, different people, different age groups, different needs, if it is not properly planned for, identified first, assessed, analyzed, had certain and clear objectives, and then well prepared plans and well if and efficient use of resources, you won't be able to, to get into any kind of results or fruits. So church administration is an essential element of proper Christian witness. And to tell you the truth, and we here among friends, and if you allow me Abuna and the Abuna and the Abuna, is that our Coptic church is very rich and very deep in spirituality but not to the same level of strength in administration. When it comes to administration, we feel that we can do better in many things. That's why this is another challenge to our Christian witness. In the meantime, our Coptic church has a heritage of a very strong institution. The Egyptian church is the oldest and the most genuine Egyptian institution in the overall church history, in the, in the overall uh, Egyptian history. Because, and I'm sure that most of you that know that, Egypt was invaded by all types of invasions. The Romans, the Greek, the Arabs, the French. And, the, and the French as well for a short time, you know, but it was very influential. So it was invaded by almost all nations. And, and, and it was ruled by different, you know, different nationalities. The only Egyptian institution that was not invaded by any foreigner was the church, the Coptic church. Because the way it was structured since San Mark and then his successor popes and patriarchs, it was always managed and led by an Egyptian. So it is the oldest Egyptian institution. And the way it is structured, which is more of, you know, it's a uh, uh, synagogal church rather than pa papal church like the Catholic church. And also, again, uh, versus the congregational church like our fellow uh, uh, Protestant church. So the way it was structured as uh, 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 synod, yeah, the synod is the ultimate authority of the church, which is made up of metropolitans and bishops, who, which is the governing body for the church. And it puts the, the policies, the legislations, and, uh, and, uh, and it dictates you know, the way the church goes. So in terms of structure, there are very strong elements of a good institution, because it has the governance, it has the mandate, it has the hierarchy, it has the systems well established, but all this from the spiritual side and from the clerical side. But when it comes to the issues that relate to programming, service, 
outreach, fulfilling the needs of today, fulfilling the needs of youth, fulfilling the needs of the poor, and how to use the resources, how to mobilize additional resources, human resources, financial resources, physical resources, information resources. There are many gaps. That's why His Holiness Pope Taudros now is very much behind uh, uh, this, uh, you know, revival and renovation uh, or reform, if I put it that way, for that particular aspect of church activity. And for this reason, I'm here today. I was invited by Abuna, and I'm invited to another course next week, also here in England. And I have been doing this for the past couple of years. <coughs> Yeah, the past couple of years, but last year particularly, I was asked by the Pope himself. I had the honor to join the, the, the technical committee that is supporting the Holy Senate, the Secretary of the Holy Senate, to start talk about how to improve our church administration. Because the Pope announced himself that his prime responsibility and his one of the things on, on, on top of his agenda is to tertibil bit min which is, the house yeah, inside. exactly, arranging the house from inside. So when we talk about church administration, we are fulfilling the request of, the, of His Holiness the Pope, and we are talking about something that we all need very much to work on. And this is linked to the Christian witness. It is not something that is fashionable. It is not something that is, you know, coming from the interest of someone like me or others. It is not something that is just the Pope thought about it and just he wants the church to do it. It is very much linked to the Christian witness, to these four circles. And if we lead well in our houses, in our homes, in our church, and if we lead well in our church, administer it well, then we will be able to influence the community outside. And this is another level of Christian witness, which is developing the outsider community. This is what we call the role of the church in community development. Some people may say, why should we bother about the community development? Why should we bother about the community in the first place? Our community is our congregation. We serve our people. Why should we go out and serve others? And the answer would be, Jesus was asked this same question 2,000 years ago. Who is my? Man who is my? Neighbor. And then Jesus gave, you know, the everlasting example of the good Samaritan. And by that, he founded a very important foundation for the church, a very important, you know, pillar of the church activity, which is serve others, even who don't have the same faith. Go out and serve the wounded, the poor, the thirsty, the weak. And the church has history in two main activities that it did for the community. Education and building schools. And what is the other activity that the church used in the past to do it, whether the Coptic church or Western churches, especially the Catholic churches? No, exactly, hospitals, medical service. So, Medical service or health service and educational service are the two very good examples on how the church, I'm talking here about the entire church, the cosmopolitan church, not a particular church. And, and probably people from Egypt know that, you know, the famous uh, and highly reputable schools, most of the highly reputable schools are, are either uh, yeah, French schools like, you know, Sacre-Cœur, like uh, Dieu, like and most of these churches actually are somehow affiliated to the Catholic Church and they do a wonderful job. The Jesuit is served by uh, Jesuitien or what you call it in English? Yeah, Jesuitien in French. You can see my, my, health, my, my French is perfect, you know. <laughs> and my wife <laughs> is always teasing me because of because my accent is very poor and my knowledge of French <laughs> is very poor. <laughs> but I insist to speak in French, so that's why she's always... <laughs> and my wife is here, by the way, she's, she's not happy with me. So, and, 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 the, and the English mission and all other schools, you know, that belong to, the, to other churches that gave a lot of activity in this. So this is a type of community activity. And then the citizenship comes into what kind of 
participation, active participation that we should do for our countries. Now for all Egyptians, and the Pope said it you know, very clearly, you know, the church is not a political institution. We are not engaged in any political activities because our role and the mandate is very clear to us. Our institution related to the spiritual service and spiritual salvation. However, we do encourage all Christians, Copts, Coptic, and even from other denominations, to exercise, to practice their citizenship with free will and with enlightenment. So this is this reflects and this is an excellent and wonderful way of expressing how should we feel toward our countries. We should feel that Egypt or Eritrea or Ethiopia or Egypt or, 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 or even England, it is my country, I have duties toward my country. I have to participate actively. I have to be aware of what are my duties, my what are my responsibilities. In the same time that I, I look for my entitlements and my rights. I have to do both. I have to be aware of this and exercise myself. Because this is part of Christian witness. When I do, when I keep the resources of my country, where I'm attentive to the resources of my country, I'm good Christian. Because I cannot be good Christian in the church while spoiling the resources of the country outside the church. That doesn't fit. It doesn't do. It has to be, it's, it's one person who behaves you know, in a holistic way. So these are the four circles of witness and the four axes of witness, if I put it that way. This is what we are going to address in the coming, in, in today we start with this, tomorrow and then on Sunday. We won't be able to cover all aspects of the four circles, we are not going, of the four axes, we're not going to talk about church administration in full or leadership in full or citizenship, we won't tackle these issues. And community development will take just one small lecture, but we try to give an overview about what we mean by all these things. We will be talking about leadership and church administration. We may touch base on the, 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 on, on the role of the church in development, and we won't touch the issue of citizenship. We will be talking about two, about three main topics: Christian leadership, holistic development, and church administration. And we hope that by end of this workshop, we hope that we get some knowledge on the principles of Christian leadership, styles of leadership, leadership and management, goal setting, spiritual landmines, leader integrity. These are some of the topics that we'll be covering starting today and tomorrow. We will also be hoping to get some skills on how to manage a church service, how to set realistic goals, how to develop plans of action for our ministry, how to delegate, how to delegate authority, how to develop others. This will be some of the skills that we hope that we can yani, acquire during this very short course. And then lastly, we will try to change some attitudes, changing you know, how do we understand empowerment? What does empowerment mean? How to be empowered and how to empower others in the course of my ministry? How to commit to a disciplined life style? How to set self-tailored life goals and commit committing to others? And how to prioritize my life activities? How to look at the totality of my life? The spiritual aspects, the professional aspects, the social aspects, the educational aspects, the service aspects. How can we look at this in totality and how can we better manage our time and our priorities? These are the kind of things we will be addressing in the coming couple of days.